I want to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Paul Zach. I'm, I'm really excited uh, about being with him again today. I've had a couple of opportunities to do these types of uh, calls with him. Um, Paul, I'm going to call him Paul because he loves the informality. Um, Paul is the founding director of the Center of Neuroeconomic Studies at Claremont Graduate University in Southern Cal. Uh, I met uh, Paul in 2017 after having read his most recent of three books that he's written titled Trust Factor, The Science of Creating High Performing Companies. So uh, if you haven't seen it or heard it, buy it. It's an awesome book. Um, there's a plug for you, Paul, if you can send me the, the, the check. Um, Paul was one of the first to identify the role of oxytocin as it relates to the, the behavior around trust. Uh, he also coined the term neuromanagement, this idea of describing how findings in neuroscience can be used uh, to create organizational cultures that have highly engaged employees who are the heart of highly performing companies. So I think we're all very interested in that. Um, I really, I think I connected with Paul as, a, as an engineer because he's taken engineering approach, which I believe his dad was an engineer, uh, but he's taken this engineering approach to neuroscience to, to seek to create uh, predictive models of behavior. So kind of engineering these models so, so that people like myself and others can use those. Uh, my first impression, Paul's a hugger. Um, he comes up, gives you a big hug, and I said, why is that? What, what, how did I feel about that? And if you read in his book, he says that hugs are a brain hack, that they stimulate an immediate, although temporary, emotional attachment. So there's all these little subtle things that we do along uh, in our daily lives that can build trust, it can build connection. And, and uh, at this point, I just want to hear more from Paul about foundation of trust. What does that mean? Paul, please, welcome. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, yeah, longtime friend of YPO uh, and of Mike, and uh, thrilled to be here. So um, I want to kind of give you your sort of five to seven minutes on some uh, potentially useful and valuable intel on culture, corporate culture. So culture is this big word. We all agree in general that culture matters. And so culture is the way that people interact with each other. Um, so we've all kind of been in, in toxic cultures. Well, not Mike, because he runs his own company, but uh, any of us have worked for other humans, have, have you know, worked with people who, uh, gosh, you're just watching the clock, right? You want to get out. Um, so how do we create a culture of really high performance? So culture is this giant term. And if it's a giant term, it's too amorphous to get uh, purchase on. So work I started doing, uh, gosh, about 20 years ago, showed that one aspect of culture, which is interpersonal trust, is a powerful lever to improved economic performance. Uh, it does this because it reduces the natural frictions that humans have when they interact with each other. So even people we like, like people in our family, can drive us nuts sometimes to generate some friction. Um, and so as Mike said, our lab was the first to identify the neurologic substrate of interpersonal trust a brain chemical called oxytocin that we developed in the engineering approach, developed a protocol to measure acutely in humans without drilling a holes into their skulls like you do in animals. Uh, so given this knowledge, we identified the mechanism. And then over time, working with organizations went backwards and asked, what are the sets of behaviors that cause the brain to release oxytocin and therefore build trust uh, between people at work? So knowing the neurologic mechanism is important because oxytocin does three important things in the brain. One, it reduces physiologic stress. So we're always balancing the desire to interact with each other, uh, other people that can be valuable or interesting with the fear that they're gonna do something that could be uncomfortable or, or harmful to us. And so oxytocin pushes on that uh, go and interact with people lever. The second is that oxytocin increases our ability to understand other people's emotional states. It increases our sense of empathy. So imagine working in a team, right? If I really understand not only what Mike's doing, but why he cares about it, I'm a much more effective team member. So evolution has given us this ability to, to accelerate uh, our, our ability to be empathic. And the third thing that oxytocin does that our experiments have shown is that it motivates us to work to help other people. Holy crap, that sounds like the, uh, the recipe for an effective organization, right? So uh, I'm calmer, I'm more empathic, and I wanna work for, for group goals, right? That's how we actually 
get effective uh, work done as a group, and our brains are set up to do this. It's not unnatural for us to work in groups. It's just how our brains are designed. So this is where the rubber hits the road. How do we do this? How do we measure it? Um, so I'm going to go through the foundations for organizational trust uh, just in a little bit of detail, and then we'll have a conversation with Mike. And then your breakout sessions will ask you to pick one of these eight foundations for trust and uh, talk to your colleagues about how you might, uh, in your own organizations, increase uh, one of these. So here's the foundational work. Trust is a behavior, not a feeling. So trust is a function of how we treat other people at work. So if it's behavior, behavior it is measurable and also manageable from a leadership perspective. You can change the way people interact at work, and I'll talk a little about how to do that. Uh, so trust is largely influenced by how leaders interact with others. That is, we are social creatures, we still need leaders, we follow leaders, and we model ourselves on what those leaders do. So you all on this call uh, are important exemplars for building a culture of high trust. Um, the second one is policies you implement in your organizations can influence how people interact with each other and therefore if they show high degrees of trust or not. Um, so uh, trust improves uh, organizational performance by uh, allowing us to more effectively uh, complete projects, to have a sense of reliability uh, that other people would do what they say they're going to do. It reduces monitoring costs because now we uh, both endow people with the trust they're going to do what they say they're going to do, but also hold them accountable so you get much greater buy-in or ownership for projects that people are doing. Um, and as you'll see, uh, part of the, the sort of systematic way that we have uh, created to understand trust in organizations is constant feedback. So I'm never letting anyone in any organization run for two or three or four weeks without lots of feedback. In fact, I recommend daily feedback. So if I'm in a high trust world, I can do the daily check-in. I love the daily five minute standing huddle. And for that, I like three questions. What did you do yesterday? What's your goal today? What help do you need? Every day, check in with that group, every day. Lots of feedback, lots of feedback. Um, okay, so what are these eight foundations for organizational trust? So somehow, magically, those eight factors spell out an easy to remember acronym, oxytocin. Think how amazingly lucky I was that these spell out the, uh, the acronym oxytocin. So let's go through them in, in order and then uh, I'll, I'll jump back in with Mike. So the O is for ovation. So ovation celebrates the contributions of high performers. So the neuroscience uh, allows us to optimize the impact of each of these factors on brain and behavior. So ovation, based on the science, is more, most powerful when it's close in time to when the goal is met or exceeded, when it's public, when it's tangible, when it comes from peers, and when it's unexpected. So for example, Mike finishes this big six month project, his team's been grinding really hard on it, and my next weekly all hands meeting. So within a week, uh, I show up with a, a big basket of uh, chocolates and uh, coffee, because I know Mike loves chocolates and coffee so much. Good coffee, not, not bad Starbucks coffee, really super good coffee. And um, I said, look, Mike, I really want to thank you and your team for, for grinding it out these last six months. You guys finished this project, the client's super happy. Tell us how you did it. So again, I'm recognizing him publicly. That sets aspirations for the rest of, of the group. It shows the community of individuals that I work with that we value high performers. Mike's getting constant feedback, but also during these ovations, we get a chance to debrief and identify best practices, right? So um, inevitably, the person being recognized, the team leader, will talk about his or her team, how they did this thing, what hurdles they came over. So that constant feedback is how the brain gets tuned to hitting high performance goals. Okay, the X in oxytocin is for expectation. This is giving colleagues concrete, difficult, but achievable goals. So these goals often require that colleagues draw on the social resources at work, increasing the opportunity for oxytocin release. So stress is not bad, full stop. I don't want you to be happy at work. I want you to be focused. I want you to be challenged. I want you to be pushing the limits of what you can do. 
And then at the end of the day or at the end of the week, feel satisfied you did something important. So expectation really means challenging people repeatedly. But after that challenge, go back to step one, rest and relax. So your brain is just like a muscle. You want to stress it temporarily and then go back and rest and recover. Stress, rest and recover, lots of feedback. Okay, the why is for yield. This is empowering colleagues to be, um, uh, to execute projects as they see fit. So uh, this increases ownership over outcomes and demonstrates trust by a supervisor who must provide this person with feedback. So I want you to do this work as you see fit. So one way to think about this is to uh, train extensively and delegate generously. Once you've been trained, I want you to do it a little differently. I want to identify positive deviations. We call those innovations. So if I have you only do things the way everyone's always done it, I never get improvements in performance. So I have to allow for some mistakes and that's okay. That's how we learn, right? So your job as a leader is to, is to be the risk mitigator, make sure those mistakes don't get really bad or catastrophic. But I need people to execute as they see fit. And then during the ovations, we share best practice. Oh, you know what? Uh, Tim did this, this project a little differently and he saved a week. Boy, the client's happy. And we just saved ourselves $20,000. Yay, team. And let the rest of the team know about this so we all can save, save time and money. Okay, the T is for transfer. This is job crafting. So in a world in which most of us live in a very low unemployment and those rare individuals who are high performers, I want you to keep working for me. I need you to keep working for me. So how do I do that? Now, instead of just delegating tasks to you and letting you decide how you execute them, uh, transfer allows colleagues to choose the tasks they want to work on, to choose the projects they're most excited about. It funnels the energy into what gives people the most, most uh, um, engagement at work. And this means telecommuting, working from different location, uh, working on an airplane, right? So there's no work-life balance for any of us. There's work-life integration. So as we let people integrate work and life, transfer allows us to focus energy on what that person does best and they become their own CEO. And believe me, if these are high performers, they have many opportunities to do different things. And so I wanna make sure you're still working for me by allowing you to job craft. Okay, just a couple more. O is for openness. One of the factors that inhibits the brain for releasing oxytocin is high levels of chronic stress. So if you're not sharing information with others, they're gonna gossip and they're gonna get stressed out about what's happening. And if I need you to be uh, self-managing, if you're your own CEO, you need for information. This could be shared profit and loss statements. It could be clarity on uh, meeting notes, uh, posting things internally or even externally. Plus everyone has phones now, right? So everything gets gonna get public anyway. So other than super private information, personnel, um, the more information you uh, put out there, the more you're trusting your, your employees to be smart with it and use it properly. Okay, three more. C is for caring. Uh, we're sort of told implicitly or explicitly in business school, you know, you can't, you, you got to have the work mic and then the home mic and the two mics shall never meet. Uh, but they're just mic, right? So um, we are built to form relationships. Uh, so companies that uh, intentionally uh, motivate individuals to form relationships with those around them increase a sense of empathy and connection to each other. And of course, we work harder for people that we know and care about. So this can be creating spaces where people bump into each other. Those can be uh, uh, sofas with wireless. It can be cafes. Uh, Google does this brilliantly, the quote free food thing. Every time I'm at Google, I, I go to lunch and I see people who never met before. They're all taking me to lunch and they have this great conversation. Oh, Tim's worked on that machine learning thing. Oh, I heard about this new initiative. Hey, what are you doing? What building are you in? Okay, let's meet sometime. Let's get a coffee. So you wanna have these uh, social collisions so that we build relationships and then can more effectively work together. Okay, two more, the I is for invest. So because I'm giving you a constant feedback, um, I don't need to only give you a performance review once a year. That's very stressful for everybody and it's too late from a brain perspective to tune your brain for high performance. So invest really means creating opportunities for professional growth, for personal growth and for spiritual growth and whatever spiritual means to you besides work and family. What else do you care about? How do you make the planet a better place? How do you get energy outside of work? Make sure that employees have that and evaluate that. So we've created this forward looking review. We can talk about where do you want to be next year, the next couple of years? Where do you, what kind of job do you want to have? Where do you want to work? Is it here? Is it someplace else? 
what are your personal goals and what are your, your kind of global goals? What do you really want to get uh, going and doing? Okay, and lastly, um, uh, the last one is natural, and that is being trustworthy uh, yourself as a leader. So again, we model individuals around us, being um, yourself at work, being um, honest, and being vulnerable are a way to actually build relationships with others and show that you trust them. So many very effective leaders are able to tell others what they don't know and ask them to engage to help the entire community get effective at something. So uh, that's a very effective way to build um, relationships at work. So as you can see, uh, here's the, the uh, eight components, uh, ovation, expectation, yield, transfer, openness, caring, invest in natural. Two takeaways and then we'll jump in with Mike. One, these are all measurable. So we've created a uh, survey uh, that you can use for free. Uh, it's at ofactor.com. Um, I think you can see the little logo there. Um, try it out, measure trust in your organization. Uh, the second is that all these factors are influenceable by policy. That is, you can explicitly intervene to create more ovations or to set challenge goals and expectation or to allow people to be more vulnerable and honest. And so all these are affected by the kind of choices you make as a leader and therefore the choices you make will affect performance of your organization. So that's the, the key takeaway. Thanks, Paul. I think you breathe, you took like three breaths in that whole- Maybe, maybe one. That was, uh, that was a lot of information, but I love how like you've engineered it around this acronym, the oxytocin acronym. So that helps me categorize and start to focus on it. A couple of things that you share that really, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily alarmed me, but things that I got a little bit concerned about, um, something like, uh, you know, how, how we influence policy to, to uh, affect others, um, such as we're going to put uh, tracking systems on all corporate vehicles so we know exactly where you are. How do you feel about that? Um, I think it should be done with, with transparency. So um, we want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, in the book, as you remember, when Paul O'Neill uh, took over uh, Alcoa and his job, heavy industry, right, making aluminum, was zero uh, injuries. That was our goal, zero injuries. And he said, there's nothing more important we can do. So one way to kind of pitch that to employees is, look, we got to keep you safe. And sometimes in construction, your business, Mike, Things go south, and, and if we know where that truck is, we know where you are most likely, and we can make sure that you know, if you don't check in on time, if things don't go well, that in fact, um, we're taking care of that. And also because we want to pay you fairly. Now, if we lose these assets on the trucks, um, then you know, we got to replace them, and that just takes money out of the pocket of paying people bonuses and other things. So um, yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, we've, as you know, Mike, we, you know, we've worked with um, you know, wearable sensors, and, and it's always an opt-in. If you want to get feedback on, on what you dig at work and, and what frustrates you, here's a technology that uh, you and your company can use. If you feel uncomfortable doing that, that's okay too. Um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a degree of self-learning that actually could also be you know, valuable to the individual. Um, another question, uh, some people don't like public recognition. They get embarrassed or introverted. All of a sudden, they're standing in front of their peers, and the boss is making a big deal with the, the coffee and the box of chocolates. Thank you very much for thinking of me. But I really would rather have you do that in the privacy of my own office or something or a thank you note. How do you find that out? That how do people really respond in the best way? Is there, should there be concern about the ways that you recognize? I mean, there's always kind of a, a, a level of sort of pathological shyness that, you know, um, people are not able to, uh, you know, be comfortable in groups. Having said that, um, most of us like to be recognized. Most of us feel comfortable. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, on a big stage with a spotlight on you and uh, saying a speech, but, you know, give us two or three words on what you worked on. So generally, because we spend so much time at work and people we work with, you know, outside of work, we, we talk about work, you know, so... Um, just give us, you know, uh, so what we do is say, you know, Tim, give me two or three minutes on um, how you uh, executed this uh, Zoom project so well. Um, you know, love to have you share that with the group. So again, from a work perspective, we generally do that. I think where it gets uncomfortable for some people is, um, tell us what you did this weekend, Mike. Tell us about your private life. Tell us, uh, you know, what crazy stuff you did. Like, oh, you know, but 
you just much progress. Most people can do that. So anyway. Thank you. So uh, I'm thinking about Facebook and Zuckerberg and this, we're sharing information and they've got access and we can block and we can add and, and, and we, we talk about how is this world trusting the use of information, um, you know, as, as individuals and how they're bundling, how they're sorting out, how they're using it to help us or hinder us. Um, how is Zuckerberg and people like, or firms like Facebook challenged with building trust of their clientele? Yeah, I think it is difficult. I mean, Facebook particularly has a, um, they've been quite invasive. Uh, again, there's companies I talk about in the book, like uh, the social media optimization company, Buffer, that puts everything out there from their, um, their federal filings, who how many shares people own. They have a salary formula that's public. Um, and so they basically have three salary levels, you know, beginning, medium, and high. And uh, you get a salary bump if you're in London or New York. Um, so it removes all that kind of gossip. So I think having that real clarity, reducing the, um, the uh, like, holy crap, what's happening, right? Did you hear the rumor? Are we getting laid off? So I, 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 again, I think in the age of, of digital everything and phones, everything eventually gets out there. So companies like uh, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, they'll do a profit and loss statement by department so that you know how your department's doing and you can share the information for the whole store. So, hey, the meat department's losing money. Uh, let's help the guy in the meat department get better, right? What are we doing in produce that, that uh, generates higher money for that? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, again, personnel issues. I think, I think. Uh, and by the way, the younger generation, they're all to quantified self. Doesn't matter so much. Paul, yeah, you seem to be breaking up for us. So maybe switching off video will help the, the bandwidth. I can do that. So, Paul, if you can hear me, um, I'm thinking about the, uh, there, there was a large online retailer that you worked with years ago that in, say, 2008, roughly, they had this really tough, horrible culture. And then they went through this transformation over the last 10 years to be a highly sought out company who's got a remarkable culture that people come from far, near and far to visit and, and to get inspired by it. How is that possible that you can go to such a great from black to white to, to make such a major transformation? What, what was necessary to do that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and uh, I'll just try to answer that briefly. Um, one is there's gotta be uh, from the very highest levels, a desire to make that change, a need to make that change. The pain has to be sufficiently high. So in these low trust organizations, we see things not only kind of low morale work, but high job turnover. So if you're getting you know, high turnover, uh, as you guys know, it takes about 100% annual salary to replace a professional. <clears throat> so if you're getting high turnover, that's, that's costing you money, costing you time. Um, so yeah, so high turnover often is a pain point uh, for that. But the second is, don't try to go from zero to 100 in one step. So in this organization you're talking about, we started with them in one division. Let's take one division and try to get better. If it works in that division, we'll learn a lot because even though I've talked about general principles, how you apply those to your specific organization depends on your culture existing now. It's not independent of what your existing culture is. And it also depends on um, how many resources you have, how much time you have. Um, uh, I was talking to Francis about being at the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada is currently doing um, uh, a big culture initiative to change the way uh, their employees interact with each other and become more nimble, uh, more, um, uh, more engaged globally. And uh, so far, it's been a, a great success. So um, even government institutions can do this, but there's got to be the sufficient pain points. So I say start small, uh, experiment. I call these management experiments. If we're going to change policies, we don't know if they're going to work. They're experiments. If you call them experiments, it means we're okay, it's okay to fail. But uh, the, the point here is to continually optimize your culture for high performance just like you optimized your supply chain or your distribution channels. Thank you. So take uh, in the U.S. you've got you've got uh, police departments that struggle with community relationships and and building trust between the law enforcement and the public. How how are these the oxytocin type factors entering into these scenarios? I know you've worked with some uh, 
various departments uh, over your years. What, what does that look like? And what can we hope for in, in seeing change in that regard? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have worked with uh, many police departments, particularly in California. And uh, one way to think about building trust with your clients or your the community that you serve, if you're the police or the government, is to begin to practice these behaviors internally so that you can also exhibit them externally. So work with your colleagues. If you can't trust your colleagues, if you're a cop and you can't trust the other cops, you're in a, a mel of a hess, as my uh, grandfather would say. So the first thing is get these habits down. These are useful, social, good social behavior habits. Practice them at work, right? So um, this means reminding people, nudging people, having posters, having signs, uh, emails, and it takes about 90 days to change a habit. So if you want to change the way people uh, interact at work, it's going to take you about 90 days of continuous nice nagging. So we call these neuro nudges. I'm just going to kind of nudge you a little bit, nudge your brain. Hey, remember, we're getting, trying to get better at uh, recognizing people around us who put in uh, extra effort. We call these ovations. And so let's remember to, um, to today, please thank someone who put in extra effort that helped you at work. Oh, gosh, I can do that. That's, you know, that'll take me five minutes, right? So walk up to someone's desk and uh, I'll thank them and tell them why. Um, that's not so hard. So same thing with police stations. So police, again, are, are in a, a very difficult position from a trust perspective because they are both targets and they have to, uh, you know, determine if someone around them in the community is safe or not safe. Uh, with Hesses particularly, I'll call out uh, Newport Beach Police Department in California. Um, we've been working with them for a couple years now and um, really a great, uh, great place, uh, really strong community relations. And they've been super open about how they're doing this uh, with their community. Thank you, Paul. Uh, last question before we go into our chat room. Uh, you have a quote in the book that says, people like leaders that are flawed like themselves. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so sometimes, uh, you know, we think if we're in charge, that we have to know everything, that we have to be perfect. Uh, so there's an effect of psychology called the pratfall effect, which is if you're a competent leader, but you make a mistake and you own that mistake, you actually become more likable. People will actually be more willing to follow you. And so just by admitting our shortcomings and asking for help, that's a kind of vulnerability that requires a lot of confidence. But leaders who have practiced that um, have followers who uh, we'll go to the ends of the earth and, and work for them. So um, I think it takes pressure off others to help those areas that you're not an expert in. You don't need to be an expert in everything. You just have to have the big vision and help execute it. So basically we're saying vulnerability pays off. Uh, yeah. Acknowledging your weaknesses is actually a strength. Oh, I'm better than I said it. Exactly right. <laughs> I should write a book on it. Should, It'll be page I long. Think, uh, I think you did. Um, why don't we uh, Why don't we move into our uh, breakouts? Um, we're going to have uh, two groups at this point. Uh, Daria is going to set us for about ten minutes. That'll get us to about eleven fifty uh, Eastern time. It'll give us about ten minutes to chat when we're done. Uh, you will be uh, just like we had for our session starter. Uh, we will uh, have you opt into that group. Uh, Paul, which question, or do we want that group to pick one of the oxytocin uh, letters and, and talk through that and then share back? Yes, that was the goal. So uh, of these uh, eight factors, talk to your group about one of those that you might influence via policy. Um, is that... You were breaking up a little bit there, Paul, for me. Um, so what we'll do is, Daria, would you please uh, get us uh, set into the meeting groups? And um, we'll proceed back to the main meeting room in 10 minutes. All right, thanks, Daria. Um, so welcome back, all. Uh, what we would like to do is have a little report out. Uh, in, and I, I guess we have a small enough group where anybody could probably jump in and just give like a one minute uh, 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 thumbnail of, of their thoughts. And, and Jim, uh, you were one in my group that uh, had a couple of uh, particularly clarifying concerns or challenges. Uh, would you mind just going through those real quick for the group's benefit? Uh, I, I think two, uh, th there's a bunch in here that is uh, congruent with other things I know. I don't think I had it connected as clearly to the oxytocin, which I really like. And um, that sort of 
I'm kind of an engineer as well, so I, I understand that component. But my biggest thing I've mentioned in the breakout was just the challenge of the goal setting that's the right level of goal for the situation the person's in. And I thought Paul said it well when he said the problem is it's a lot of work. And I think that's relevant. Um, some of these you can do reactionary. That's not one you can do reactionary. You have to think it through and you have to obviously interact with the person. So I thought his feedback on, on, uh, on that in terms of assessing stress level as you think about the goal level, the goals I've sort of done intuitively, but not thought about it sort of upfront like that. So I thought that was, uh, I thought that was good. Thanks, Jim. Uh, how about uh, another, another group? Uh, I see Heather, Alexandra, others uh, that were in a, another meeting group. Does anybody want to uh, be a spokesperson and share a couple of thoughts from that group? Paul. Yes, sir. From what you heard, what are some wrap up comments that you might have to kind of, you know, instill this go forward plan? What is it that uh, people can feel is relevant and is easy to take away and bring into their business? I mean, what's the first step? For me, it was, I've got the book, I've read it, I've got all these ideas around the eight different elements, and I've kind of done a bit of an audit, like how am I doing, and then how can I do better? Um, but what if the, the, the top of the pyramid, or what if there are employees that are just thinking this is a bunch of BS. Like, I, I just don't think it's for me. I mean, what, how do you take care of, how do you address the, the challenging employee or how you roll out this initiative to, to really start to make a significant change? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple things. One is a measure. Um, so in, in organizations of any size, uh, I was talking uh, beforehand to Francis, he has a big enough organization where he can assess the trust exemplars and trust laggards. So think of trust as a leaning indicator for performance. When trust is higher, performance will be higher. And the, the uh, relationship between them is actually very strong statistically. So if uh, Francis does this, uh, this survey, and I'll talk about a simple way to do that, and he finds out that uh, trust is super high in the, I'm making this all up now, in the uh, Quebec division, and uh, the folks in Toronto, not so much. Um, find out what the, what's going on in Quebec, right? What are they doing differently? What is that culture like? Why is that, um, what's the leader doing that's different? So first thing is just copy. Um, so you can assess trust lots of ways. When we do it, we never ask about the word. We never say the word trust. We actually talk about behaviors. But here's a simple way that members can do this, which is um, uh, just do a simple survey that says, on a typical day, how much do you enjoy your job? One to seven. Right. If you're getting fives and sixes and sevens, looking good. Again, twos and threes, not looking so good, right? Do it anonymously and just try to find out by division where things are, by location. And then start to think about, gosh, if you don't really like being here, <laughs> you know, that's not so good, right? Um, we've all been, you know, like in clients' offices where, you know, you see the slumped shoulders, you see the people walking slow. They are not energized about whatever they're doing, right? So I want people with high energy. I like skeptics. I've done many uh, work with tr building trust in many organizations, and I like it when people go, ah, sounds like bullshit to me. I love that word, actually. Sure, that's a good skeptical word. Be skeptical. But all this is employee-centric. It's about empowering individuals who are creating value for clients to be as effective as possible and to control their work lives subject to hitting their goals. And those goals are organizational goals and personal goals. So number one, get data. Number two, share that data. If you do a survey, you've got to tell people what you found and then what you're going to do with it. So look, hey, we want to get better at empowering you guys to um, be really effective at work so our organization can thrive and you can thrive as a professional colleague and even as an individual. Um, so here's the plans we want to do. We're going to collect some data and we're going to try to act on it so that um, we're running these management experiments to improve uh, the, the life here within the office. No one can complain about that. And if they do, then probably they need to get off the bus. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, I think transformative leaders do a great job at setting agendas and driving people towards those agendas. And this agenda is a triple win. It's good for the employees. It's good for the organization. And we've shown in extensive research that people in high trust organizations are happier and healthier. That is, they take fewer sick days, 
they're better parents, they're better citizens, because they have a great work-life integration, they're valued at work, and they're empowered to do what they've chosen to do. So the punchline here is everyone who works for you is a volunteer. They don't have to work for you. They can go work for, for Mike, they can go to work for Peter, they can go to work for um, Alberto. Why would they continue to work for you? Treat them like a volunteer, thank them, ask them, uh, give them opportunities to grow, empower them with information to make good decisions and recognize that everyone's not perfect, including us as leaders. And when you're in that kind of world that's honest and caring, uh, I think you can move forward. And all this is not monetary, by the way, not gonna cost you any money, but it's just good human behavior. That's the way the humans are. Thank you, Paul. It looks like we're at the top of the hour here. So um, I would uh, like to, again, thank you for joining. I uh, thank all the participants for joining today. And I, and I wanna let people know Paul is having a direct impact on our organization because uh, YPO is now working with him to conduct research and really push the fact that we believe YPO scales trust better than any other organization uh, and, and to prove out that YPO companies are uh, more successful as a result. So uh, we are looking for more active uh, participants in a survey that will be done on trust that Paul's organization is doing. So email uh, Tim, myself, uh, Daria, whomever, uh, if you're interested. And again, thank you for joining uh, this Only in YPO GCC. I apologize for the, uh, uh, some of the technical challenges and we're looking forward to people getting more comfortable with the format of these breakout groups and being more engaged. So again, I thank everybody for their participation and uh, wish you all a great uh, week. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate your time on, on this call. Awesome, thank you. Many thanks, Paul thanks. and Mike. The recording of this virtual learning session will be available on our multimedia platform, The Source, within 48 hours upon conclusion of this call, as well as any information pertaining to Paul's surveys will be included into the follow-up email for all of the registered participants today. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening. Hope you enjoyed this virtual learning from YPO Innovation Week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.